And something should never happen amongst the people of God, but they do. But they're not the reason to leave. No, they must be. So what, what was this famine? There was a famine in the land. But we could say a great deal about the famine of the word of God and so on. It's a very interesting take on that when you come to Samuel. No, but I'm, we don't have time, so I'm not leaving. But what was the famine? Why should there have been a famine yeah, in the place? Bethlehem, or what place? It means the house of bread. It's kind of rubbing in it, isn't it? In the house of bread, there's no bread. So Elimelech's got a family, and presumably boys at that time were young age anyway. He says, look, can I hope I don't know whether he says something, something like this. We, we need to look after our family here. We're going to have to bow out. Because there's nothing much to eat here. Which seems very sensible. But what, well, first of all, why, why was the family there? You know, the Lord had warned his people that certain failures on their part would result in his withholding what makes for a good harvest. I'm not saying that was the case here because we're not told whether it was or not, so we can't say. We're just saying it's a possibility at this point. It's a possibility that it was divine judgment. And it's hard to trace that back in the book of the Judges, but it was there at some point. And we know that God did come in judgment time and time and time again. And then in his grace he raised up saviors for them. God's providence is seen in different ways. And this is worth not on this point. God's providence is seen in his creative and sustaining sense of providing for us, as in the case of food. That's part of what he said to Noah, by the way, of the seasons and the harvests and so on, springtime and harvest. This is going to happen, and that happens because of God's providence. And I, I kind of like this time of the year when we give God thanks for the harvest, and I used to have a bit of a deal about that. And, uh, the problem with my children being at school is that they don't even think, well, they, you know, they, it's just not what Cain did. He brought the fruit of the ground to the world. Well, I, no, I've moved on a little bit from that now. I know there's a, a principle there, but here's the thing. It's right that we should give God thanks for the harvest. Quite right and proper. It's part of his providential care and his creatorial and sustaining work that he does as God. But there's another sense of God's providence that God can be providential to us in withholding things that we think are really, really necessary for our good and our enjoyment. And he's going to do that. That's the theme of he, part of Hebrews 13, where it says he chastises us for our own good. So God's providence isn't always in giving us things. It may be in withholding things as well. Whatever it was here, we can't say. But either way, either way, Faith is needed to meet that revelation of God's character in his providential care of us, either by giving or withholding. And I'm afraid that faith is not what's being seen here in a limelight going down to my It's kind of absent. Faith is an interesting thing. Faith doesn't remove obstacles. It doesn't remove us from trouble. Faith sees us through trouble. You know that great text in Isaiah 43? Fear not, I have redeemed you. Called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, they will not burn you. You know what that text doesn't say, don't you? Fear not, I have redeemed you, I have called you by your name, you are mine. And I will never let you go through deep waters and fire. He doesn't say that. He says, when you do, I'll be with you. And you're not to fear because I've set certain limits on that water and that fire. And there are certain things they cannot do. He doesn't say, he'll keep us out of it. And you and I have to follow Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. So in Nebuchadnezzar's furnace, and there's this megalomaniac, and he's peering into the furnace, and he said, didn't we put three men in there? I see four. And the fourth is like the Son of God. That's Isaiah 43. 
She said, I'll be with you in the thing. Didn't say, keep them out of it. But when you go through it, I'm with you and it makes all the difference. That's what faith does. Look, I'm, I'm trying not to be too harsh on Elimelech, but Elimelech, stay in Bethlehem, Judah. And the key there is Judah. It's in the land, it's in the place. You've been called into a place where God gave you, says, I know that, why know that? Good places. There's a whole story behind that, you know. Can I just say, look, one more thing, and, and, and we'll, we'll give a little leg of a break. Because <laughs> I'm feeling bad about this already. Um, um, sensible choices are not always the best, because you have to work out in whose view are they sensible? And if you want another example of that, this is one of them, but one of them is Lot. And you know the connection there. So here's Lot, and he's standing with Abraham. And you know the background, it's just Genesis. It's in Genesis. And uh, he says, you, the land's before you, you can choose now. And uh, Lot sees the well watered plains of what's now the Arabah, wasn't it? And he thought of the beautiful land he'd seen down in Egypt. He that would work well for the flocks. This is going to work well for the flocks. I'll go down there. Sensible choice. If you were a businessman in terms of herds and flocks, and which is what they were in those days, what do you want? Good pasture land. Sensible choice. Lot may have been selfish, but in business terms, it was sensible. You know, you could write every bit of sense into a limited decision to leave Bethlehem, Judah. Go down to Moab. It doesn't make it one I hope to more right. Be better off not doing it. Be careful with sensible decisions. Oh, I said I said that was the last thing. This is definitely the last thing on a limelight. And this isn't really him. Well it is. You know, the book of Ruth covers a time span of something like 10 or more than that, 11, 12 years. And let me tell you, you know this already probably, the first 10 years of that period that this little book covers are covered in the first five verses of chapter 1. Isn't that interesting? Apparently, when you move away from God, all that you do doesn't really count for a whole lot. A friend of mine down in Colorado would say it doesn't amount to a whole hell of beans. <laughs> if you walk with God, every detail counts. The rest of this book has to do with days and weeks and the most months. Sometimes hours. Every detail counts when you're in the company of God. Move away from God, not so much. Now, let's say something quickly about Naomi. I've called it Naomi's Renewal. This, this, look at this with me, if you've got your Bibles open. There's an instructive sequence here in, in verses six through to the end. In verse six, she heard. In verse seven, she went out. Verse seven again, she began to return. The word returns there. In verse 19, she came. That means she arrived. That's a secret. I, I, I leave it with you for, for useful whatever, because it's, it's, it's worth thinking about. She heard. I, I've got four granddaughters, and um, one of them you know well, Martha. She's, she's been around there. A bit. The other three little rascals, are in uh, England, and I hear their parents saying to them sometimes, have you got your listening ears on? <laughs> and we all know what that means, of course. I, I, listen, I say this with absolute reverence. I, I think that's a, a sort of version of what the Lord Jesus said. When he told the parables, and he did it again when he wrote letters to his churches in Revelation. He who has ears, they can hear. He said, have you got your listening ears on? You're really, really listening. Well, apparently, Naomi was. It's a good start, isn't it? You look and speak, and you don't necessarily listen. We 
need to. She heard. That was the first thing. She went out. That's verse 7. That's definitive. It's a picture of repentance. It's a turning around. She had been somewhere and she's turning around going back. It involved leaving certain things behind. The old doctrine of separation so important. In 7 again, it says that she began, she returned. That's, if the, if the first thing is she went out, that's definitive. This return is directional. It's showing that she's actually going in a particular place. This wasn't she, she went out to, to go anywhere. It was a particular place that she was going to, and that's important. Um, Genesis 13 tells you that Abraham had been down to Egypt, not a mistake, uh, and he was going back, and it says he went up into the south. And I preached a sermon on that once, and somebody came to me afterwards and said that, he didn't say that was nonsense, but it, uh, he said it in a much nicer way. But, uh, he was saying, it, the word south is near. It's, it's a geographical area. So I said, yeah, I, 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 I know that. But it's still going into a defined area. Um, and that, that was the problem. The, a, Abraham had slipped right through the land that he'd come out of Mesopotamia that God was going to show him. Slipped right through it into Egypt. Now he's going, and it was so important that he got back into it. See, we, we're not left to go to a place of our own choosing. This is directional. And he went back to the place. Uh, and, and this is what Naomi is doing. She went back. And the last thing is she, she, she came to Bethlehem. Well, that's a rifle. But she didn't stop halfway and think, well, you know, we've made it halfway. This is okay. It wasn't okay. She was going back to where uh, she kept going. That's the point. Uh, notice that her submission, we'll pick that up on another occasion because it occurs later on, but Naomi here is not claiming any rights as people do these days. Um, she just was submissive to the sovereignty of God, even though it had, in her words, been very, very bitter and it has emptied her. She was submissive to it. So it's not a reminder of Job. I, you know, I can't get over Job. I go back and back to that book and every time I'm not one job less impressed than I was before. I, I'm, I'm more impressed. You know what he says in chapter 2? The man's lost his family. Chapter 1. In chapter 2, the devil's come and he's covered him with pain. Painful, not spoils, painful ones. And then from the sole of his feet to the crown of his head, he's covered in the things. And he's sitting, this poor man taking broken pottery and scraping himself to get some relief. And if that wasn't the, the end of things for Job, his wife comes to him and says, why do you hold on to your integrity? Curse God and die. And I've sometimes thought that was the worst blow that he ever received. He lost the support of his wife. And he lost everything else. What was she thinking? Job says, you're speaking like a foolish woman. woman. And he meant by, you're speaking like somebody who's no knowledge of my God. And then he says this. It's one of those supreme things that stands out of the book of Job. He says, shall we not accept good? And shall we not accept adversity from his hand? And he's just totally submissive to the sovereignty of God, who Abraham says, shall not the judge of all the earth do it. That's where we are, isn't it? Life is difficult sometimes, but to be submissive to it is what Naomi is teaching us. We'll pick that up again. Now, very quickly, Ruth. I've called this Ruth's resolution, and it's so well known, isn't it? Um, notice first of this setting, because there's three of those in the beginning of this little picture on the Bethlehem Road, and there's a certain poignancy about that. If we had more time, I'd like to talk to you about another threesome, but we'll leave that for another occasion. For all past decision to go back is painful, and we shouldn't gloss over it. And Paul says, writing to the, the Philippians, he says, um, there are those who walk as enemies of the cross, and I tell you about them weeping. Oh, 
those who went by. So we, we noticed with grief all parts going by. She went back to the idols of Moab. How sad. The cost to her was too great. And she went back to her old life. Um, the rich young ruler came running to the Lord Jesus, uh, Mark 10. And um, he said, good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? The Lord says, you know the Lord's And he said, the man says, oh, I've ticked off, ticked off, I've done it, done it. So the Lord Jesus said to him, well, you go home and sell all that you've all you've got and they come and follow me. You know, that was never a prerequisite to discipleship for, for everybody. Not general prerequisite, but it was for that man. No why? Because the man who claimed to have kept all the commandments and he broke the first one. And the Lord was pointing out to him that he hadn't even kept the first commandment. He had other gods. So you've got to go and get rid of that. So uh, the man turned, you know, so he turned away and went away sorrowful. I once saw a painting of that. The artist was brilliant because it was just the back of the man. And I don't know how you paint sorrow into someone's back. But this man, this artist did, and he, he had the man, I don't know, sort of slung shoulder or whatever it was. And the man was looking at him. He said, no one looked him and loved him. He never called him back. Never offered him a cheaper kind of disciple because there is no cheaper disciple. It's commitment to honor. And that's the point about Ruth. It's full commitment. You ever wondered why? You wondered why God demands such level of commitment? There's only one reason. It's because it's a reflection of his own heart. And if you and I are really going to enjoy God to the full, one day we shall. It'll be through full and absolute commitment. No half-heartedness. You'll never find God that way. Hebrews says, uh, speaking about the Lord Jesus, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish unto God. That's a trinity. That's God the Son offering himself through God the Spirit to God the Father. And it tells me that when Christ died at Calvary, the triune God was involved. Three persons of the Godhead, utterly involved in the cross. If that's not commitment, from the body is. God poured himself into the cross. And that's why he asks for commitment from, from us. And Ruth says a, a wonderful thing that she says, learn so well, where you go, where you lodge and so on. Where you go. She was willing for someone else to choose the path. Where you lodge, where you rest, she was willing for someone else to choose the resting place. You, you, you'll do the, the computation, I know, relative to our own, our own experience. Your people will be my people. However despised, rejected, persecuted, ridiculed they may be, they're my people. Your God will be, like the Thessalonians, turned unto God from idols to serve the true living God. And there, where you die, there will I die, and there will I be buried. No temporary thing. Lifelong commitment. That's, that was Ruth. Um, it's interesting just to notice verse 18 there. It, it says, when Naomi saw that she was determined, and in my Bible it's got a note in the margin that says, made herself strong. I was at a baptism, two baptisms recently in Stoke, a mother and a daughter both baptized and I was just reflecting uh, I, I, I suppose this happens to me in every baptism these days since it's sort of dawned on my dim head that this is what actually happens at baptism this person has made themselves strong and I looked at this lovely lady and her daughter and these two women have made themselves strong like Ruth Why would you get baptized? Why, why, why did we do it? It's a ridiculous thing, isn't it? In this day and age, surely, you know, you don't, you don't need to actually go into water and do that sort of stuff, yeah? And then you and I hear the voice of the Master 
Saviour who loved us. You say he commanded it, so I must do it. And we make ourselves strong against the ridicule of the world to do it. Well, it's, it's the whole thing with discipleship. We make ourselves strong. Um, that's what Ruth did. Finally, we'll come back to it. So much more to say about it. But just to finish off tonight, and I'm sorry about the time. Finally, Fields of Bethlehem is where this chapter ends, isn't it? Begins there, quickly descends into Moab. And then we get back to the fields of Bethlehem. We're only in chapter 1. And you just picture the scene, the women of Bethlehem, seeing this older woman, probably late 50s, 60s maybe, but with all the look of haggard life that she'd had in her, she's looking old. But there's something familiar about her. Is this Naomi? Another one says, yeah, I, I think that's Naomi. And she hears them. Don't call me Naomi. That, that name means pleasant. Call me Mara, because that means bitter. And by the way, she's not saying, she, this is not some embittered old woman. I want to tell you that I will tell you more about this on another occasion, God willing. Naomi is one of the heroines of the Bible. Wonderful woman. She's not even bitter. She's saying, God has dealt bitterly with me. There was bitterness in my life. She's accepting. She says she's empty. You know, when I was a boy, my mother used to give me um, bits of little printed things. I think they were sort of Victorian. They were so old fashioned. Uh, they're still being a prep of my mother got them. And she used to slip them or put them where I couldn't help but notice them. And uh, there were little bits of poetry and so on. And one of them said this. Still got it, by the way. <laughs> he emptied my hands of my treasured store. And his covenant love revealed. There was not a wound in my aching heart, but the balm of his breath had healed. Oh, tender and true was his chastening saw in wisdom that taught and tried until the soul that he sought was trusting in him and nothing on earth beside. You know, sometimes it's good to be empty. Right? Because empty things can be filled. It's the way God wants it. Sometimes he'll empty out our lives because he wants to fill them with better things. Naomi said she was empty, and she stood there with Ruth at her side, and they're looking at a field of barley harvest, the first of the harvests. Isn't that so indicative? We're just in chapter one here, and you know that because we've read the last bit, we're not supposed to do that. If you've ever tried reading a part of the Bible and pretended you never read it before, I try and it's quite very well. Imagine Ruth chapter 1, you don't know what's happening, and they're standing there in front of the fields of barley, and it's just, why have you told us that? It's the beginning of barley, because there's a harvest to come, and these two women have not got a clue as to how, what sort of yield these fields are going to bring into their lives. You and I know, because we've read it. Isn't it good? God knew. Yeah. He's brought them to that point. To the human eye, it doesn't look very much. Two widows, one feeling empty. I mean, knowing the bitterness of life, and life can be bitter. The other one, who is an alien in a foreign country, with no security, no air, and therefore no future. Just the kind of material that God works with, isn't it? That's the memory. Well, Lord, we thank you for this beautiful little French book. It's taken us from a dark book into a book of beginnings of the kingdom. As you developed it and ordained it. And we thank you for its beauty because it rests on your sovereignty and your purposes being fulfilled. We know that we can relate those things to our own lives and our own time, and we thank you for it. We ask now that you'll help us to do it. We love for the word to dwell in us richly, so that we might recall it day by day, 
as the decisions, the choices, and the experiences, some of them unsought, come into our lives. And we ask God to help us to meet them with all the challenges that they are. And we pray for those who are meeting greater challenges than others. And you know exactly who and which are and which they are. God, bring your grace, please, to bear upon lives that are reaching out to you just now for help and strength. We ask you to supply it as you did to these two dear women. So we commit our way to you. We thank you for our time together. We ask for Jackie, mercies back home, and just pray your blessing upon what we've considered together in the name of the Saviour, our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, oh, we with thee. Oh, sir.